The following is a bonus episode of The Dental Guys. Hey, we'd like to thank Zerk for sponsoring uh, The Dental Guys. And one of the things that John and I have talked about that Zerk has is great isolation products. You guys know when you're prepping and whenever you're doing your work that isolation is key. But Zerk has, John, this new thing called Isolation 360 Power Pack. What in the world is this, John? Well, all the products pretty much that you've heard us try out and use from Zerk, just about all of them are included, plus some that we, we haven't talked about but that we've used in our practice. So it's basically a box that allows you to try everything out that they have as far as isolation and see what you want to use. So it's got the pink pedal, which you've heard us talk about. It's got the airway armor, which we really love. Uh, it's got Mr. Thirsty, which we've talked about. Insti Dam, which is kind of an immediately ready dam, rubber dam ready to go. They're all single use products, but they're all put together in this box where you can open this up and you can immediately see what they do, how it can help your practice. And they've put it in a pretty competitive price here that if you buy the whole thing, it's a pretty good deal. But really what, I, what Wes and I think is this is a way, if you've got your typical size practice, a single doc, maybe mm -hmm. two doctors, it has enough of these that just about everybody in your practice, your hygienists, your doctors can try these products out, see if they fit with your practice workflow. And if they do, you can you don't necessarily have to keep buying just this box. You can buy each individual product that you love separately. But this is a great way to get into some of the, we feel like, the most comprehensive uh, product portfolio of isolation and visibility type of products that anybody has out there. Well, you can't beat the price to be able to try all these products mm -hmm. and have enough to be able to kind of repeatedly try them. A hundred bucks for all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's like Christmas right, right now. That's exactly right. I think right. this is a great time to maybe try some of these things out to see next year what you're going to start incorporating from Zerk into your practice. Listen, because time is everything, it really does help for you to be able to get things done quickly, keep it isolated, keep it dry. And that's why we like Zerk products is because they have great innovations that allow you to do things more efficiently, keep it organized, keep the flow going in your practice with less disturbance and keep that overhead low. So we want you to check out Isolation 360 Power Pack. If you'll head over to Zerk.com right now and mention the dental guys, we really appreciate Zerk and their sponsorship of this episode. Thank you. Okay, and welcome back to The Dental Guys. We're here live at Spear Summit 2018 out in Scottsdale, Arizona. And Wes, it has been an amazing, amazing meeting. We have had uh, just speaker after speaker. Everyone that's been on has just been amazing. And, and you know, we have somebody very special with us today, Dr. Bob Winter. And uh, we've gotten to know Dr. Winter through some of the workshops that we've taken here, uh, which has just been amazing. And Dr. Winter teaches uh, a lot of the uh, restorative design, the worn dentition, implant workshops, you know, some of the higher level workshops that you get to once you've kind of done your entry points into Spear, you know, and you really start to dive into the clinical side. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously very, very experienced, both from the dental side, but also from a laboratory side, you know, has a ton of experience there. And so thank you for being with us today. Oh, Bob. It's, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So Wes, let's kind of talk about what we're going to focus on today. So we really wanted to focus on is ceramic material choices and preparation design. I know that's kind of one of your favorite things to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. One, you teach a course on, you know, basically how to prep right. teeth properly. And I want to really just start out with this at, I, Years ago, I went to a CE course where I had some high-level people that were doing some beautiful dentistry, and they talked about that they never did, when they were doing like aesthetic cases, in, when, in the 90s when it started exploding, everyone was getting veneers, and they said they would only do either 4, 7 through 10, or 8 or 10. And the problem that they saw was they were having problems with the transition of the canine to the premolar and you know the canine is a troubled tooth to prep sometimes uh, and I want you to share some light on why they said that and uh, why you, it's hard for them to, you to tell why but I think you yeah. know why they said that and because that tooth one is thick from buckled to powdery it's it's thick it does create some shade instances, but 
are we under preparing or do we just need to choose different restorative materials when it comes to this particular dilemma? Uh, you're, you're touching on multiple uh, points uh, in a, that. It's uh, an open conversation. In, in that thought, yes. right? So, um, yeah, one of my pet peeves actually back in the 90s was the saying of, I got to do 10 and 10, right? 10 up or 10 lower. Mm. And that always just graded me really wrong. Um, and why was that? Why was that being said? Um, if you think at, at that timeline, the aesthetic revolution that was occurring, um, cleaner, lighter, brighter teeth, and making, I'll say, significant changes from the original two shade, I, uh, that could be reasonable thought process, right? Because mm-hmm. um, if someone wanted to go from an A3 to a, a bleach shade and they couldn't do it bleaching, then you have to involve more teeth. You can't do the upper four or upper two, right? You have to get around the corner and include the canine and get to the bias and sometimes first molars. So it's the outcome is driving what you have to do. Um, today, I think we've kind of backed off on that for a lot of practices, right? That they're not making so severe changes and therefore now you're matching natural teeth uh, mm-hmm. more and more. So for sure, it's, I'll say, relatively easy to do the upper four interiors um, and have a great outcome. Um, the problem child, as you're describing it, is the uh, upper canine. Uh, it's generally more chromatic, um, so there's a color change. So if you make a shade lighter on the upper four, then that canine may stand out more. So it's a different shape than the four interiors. It is rounder, but um, if you want to lighten that tooth to blend in more with the anterior four, yes, you have to prep a little deeper to create the space to be able to mask out to have a greater shade change. So um, um, that, I think, is uh, my concept of what I try and teach in restorative design is to get the people to think about it's outcome-based preparation design. Mm -hmm. Where do I want to finish the case? And most often, it's the aesthetic aspect of it. So for my definition of aesthetics, it's really shade, shade and value. And so I vary the preparation depth based on the changes that are gonna be made. Mm. So prepping the canine in itself isn't so difficult, right? It's curved surface rather than a flat surface from the anterior teeth, but it's just the adequate depth reduction is the key. And, and recognizing that curved surface versus the flat surface because the incisal edge prepara- preparation is the first thing that starts, chip, typically. Actually, I've changed that concept. Have you really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, my <coughs> entire career. So you're uh, reverse crown prep? Um, not quite, but I'll describe it. Okay. So virtually, I've changed this um, maybe in the last six months to a year. Okay. And, it's, and mm-hmm. it's based on what I was seeing happening with prep designs in, in the workshop. What okay. were you seeing that caused you to change? Um, um, over preparation of teeth. Mm-hmm. And here my ultimate goal is to prep teeth um, with clear intent, right. right? And achieve the depth you want to. And that means we use depth limiting words. Everyone's familiar with mm-hmm. depth limiting words sure. on a mm-hmm. facial aspect. They classically are uniform three tenths or five tenths. And 25 or so years ago, I developed the concept of a depth limiting burr that had tapered depth cut, so more incisally, so you could develop the translucency needed and so forth. Um, so I introduced some burrs with Brassler. Uh, the first series was maybe 18 or more years ago. Um, a new set of burrs that I developed to try and help people prep. Um, appropriately in the gingival third I provided a non-cutting tip a safe tip so now it would be physically impossible to over prep in the gingival third because without that safe tip you tip the burr in too much and you can get it too deep right okay so it's a three-banded burr and if you do the incisal reduction first the incisal band when you prep the facial aspect, winds up many, many cases for clinicians in the middle third of the tooth. Yeah, the shank doesn't of that. Well, burr. they move that the the incisal band that's going to cut mm-hmm. in the center of the in tooth. In the center of right. the tooth, right? Right. So what I would see is your reduction is more than you would want. So I've reversed that, 
and now I do the labial depth cuts first. Okay. And I have people in training, right? Take a marker and, and draw a line about two and a half millimeters from the incisal edge and then put the, the diamond burr in that uh, line. And then when I go to the incisal edge depth cut, and let's say I'm gonna do a two and a half millimeter reduction because I'm going to um, do a layered restoration, so mm -hmm. I need a little bit more space. That depth cut then, um, the incisal third of the prep is essentially finished. Yes. Um, so I've once I've introduced that, again, I run 35 or so, almost 40 people through the workshop every time, and I start seeing the outcomes, and I see a dramatic improvement in the outcomes. Interesting. So That's very um, interesting. I mean, I've developed a lot of concepts over the years um, to do things um, more precisely, but more accurately, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And consistency is the key, and I'm seeing that helps a lot of people prevent over-prepping. Okay. So, so, huh. so um, just I, get, I do just the, the, the depth cuts facially, fa you know, mm -hmm. then I do depth cuts incisally, then I reduce the incisal edge, and then I proceed with reducing the facial aspect. Can you talk a little bit about, um, we're, since we're into kind of burrs, and I, and I think it's, I know it's such a, an area of passion for you, is you mm -hmm. know, burr selection. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about different uh, internal line angle designs wi with regard to materials? So there's, you know, the KR series of burrs with, you know, kind of a shoulder internal rounded versus a chamfer. Um, and, and I know that, again, if you take the, the workshop, you learn all about sure. these things. But for our listeners that may not have taken that, you yep. know, what that's a very basic question we hear a lot is what burr should I choose? What what type of finish line design? Yeah, it's a, a great question, again, commonly asked. Um, if you look from a, a laboratory side, the most problematic area is always the gingival third because it's typically under reduced you create on the average 50% less reduction than you think you're doing. Mm. So then the technicians struggle with, I'll say the aesthetics, but most importantly for me is always looking at strength of the material first. And if you look at materials and probably the most commonly used material anteriorly, it would be Emax mm -hmm. lithium disilicate. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Iva Clark's recommendations, for prep design, it is a one millimeter flat shoulder with a round internal line angle. And if you think back of shoulder preparations, back when I was in dental school, that one millimeter has been the standard, um, even though you were doing metal ceramic and a porcelain margin. So that hasn't changed. Um, so you get into the internal line angle design, right? So it's not a deep chamfer. Mm -hmm. You truly need a shoulder, so the ceramic sits flat on that, at, on that shoulder. You don't want a chamfer in the shearing action. Mm -hmm. So um, that is a key. So the internal line angle, it's always best to be rounded because uh, if you look at flow of cement, to go in a 90 degree uh, internal line angle, virtually the cement doesn't flow well. Okay. So a rounded internal line angle helps the flow of cement get more positive seating, complete mm -hmm. seating. Um, and then you talk about different burrs. You know, some people would use an end cutting burr or a, a flat uh, uh, shoulder design. Mm -hmm. Well, that creates a sharp internal line angle. And, and the other problem with that burr is as you, if I was prepping this tabletop, right, it's a flat plane and I can make a very sharp edge, mm -hmm. but teeth aren't like that. There's the curve as you go interproximally and so forth. So to, um, if you're using a flat ended burr, you create a stair step effect, the right. chatter at the margin. It so actually looks like that under high power loops. For sure, it's easy it. to see, yeah. right? And laboratories have to deal with it all the time. If you're if you're scanning in your office and you're trying to mill it, it's virtually impossible mm -hmm. to mill because mm -hmm. they, they won't will not over mill and then you won't get positive seating in your restoration. Or they'll create some an expansion gap to counteract that. Yeah, that's that's true, right? right. So so then you get into the K Arbor, which is flat ended and rounded corner. Um, so it was a significant improvement over a flat-ended sharp corner, but you still create the stair-step problem. Mm -hmm. So I introduced a burr um, now a couple of years ago, which is a, we'll call it a hybrid burr. Um, if you look at the round-ended burr, um, which is what I've traditionally used to create a flat shoulder, um, <coughs> the problem with that burr is you create lipping, mm -hmm. right? The, the J-hook. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. cup. So the new bird I developed has a multi-radius tip design. Mm. So it eliminates the lipping and it eliminates the stair-stepping occurrence. Mm -hmm. So um, 
for me, that's the burr that I would use, and the people that are using it in the workshops immediately see a difference. Mm. And I have margin refinement burrs that are have the same tip design, so now it's safe sided on the you know you can lay it on lay it on the axial wall, and you can smooth margins very simply. So it takes the stress away, mm. and you can get ideal um, preparation finish lines, both the finish line as well as the ideal internal rounded shape so what would you say to somebody that says yeah I don't, you know i've been prepping teeth for 20 years and i just really don't think i need that <laughs> it's funny I, i'm not here to brag about w what i'm doing but um i've been teaching this workshop for probably now eight or nine years and i do 10 a year so i've seen s several thousand people um in this workshop so i i know the real world in that environment it's a good sample size yep mm -hmm. and i've um been involved i've had my own commercial laboratories you know for the last 35 years so i've seen a lot what comes into the lab and um what's pretty cool is whether it's a young individual coming out of school or someone that's been practicing 30 40 years i've had clinicians 40 years or plus coming into the course and they say that it's a transformational change hmm. because now they're thinking about the outcome and how they have to um, modify the prep based on the outcome and material selection. Hmm. So it's been really exciting for me to see because I then see people when they come into the, the, the following workshop, which is a natural evolution, and I always survey the group and ask the questions. And How's your prep? Yeah. yeah, how the preps, and they say, well, I'm 20 to 30% faster, mm. and yet the outcome is significantly better, mm. and all of a sudden they're, they're, their eyes are just beaming because yeah. the aesthetic outcome is better, and yes. they're not having any you know, fracturing issues or, or minimized it. So, so this, is, this is excellent conversation. And I think maybe we, we should continue on because I, I want to ask a question that comes back to some discussion we had way back in workshops about um, how this concept of, of creating a, a less stair stepping, creating less lipping, um, and, and how that relates to materials. Because we have you know, two ways of, of, of creating lithium disilicate restorations. We have milling and we have pressing. And one of the things it seems like pressing may help with mm -hmm. is some of these irregularities in uh in the the marginal design and we know that because and this is a, this kind of a revelation to wes and i that you know it shouldn't have been a revelation but we understand why zirconia margins are so nice because we're we are uh, uh working on something that is much larger uh when it's being milled versus a one-to-one -one milling and do you think milling of, of lithium desilicate is at a level where it rivals pressing, or do you think that we are still a ways away from being able to achieve an, an, a marginal design that's as smooth as, as uniform? Um, well, you set this up perfectly because you described the problem, and that's the preparation. Mm -hmm. So if I have a preparation design that the finish line is smooth and crisp, you can wax and press or mill with essentially the same accuracy. If I have an irregular finish line, which is commonly occurs because people don't use high enough magnification, two, two and a half power loops is pretty typical. Mm -hmm. If they can't see the stair stepping, if they can't see the lipping, then they can't smooth it because they don't know it's there. Um, then in the laboratory, they can easily see it. And if I'm traditionally waxing, I can fill in all those irregularities, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. invest it and press it. And so therefore pressing becomes way more accurate than milling because it's virtually impossible to mill those type of uh, preparations. So it's all about the preparation mm. design and smoothness. Well, I think one thing that I did and I, when, I, when Gary was teaching um, occlusion, Mm -hmm. He talked about that when you are prepping a full arch, that you start to kind of get, you know, this vision that it's hard because fatigue, you, you basically. fatigue, mm -hmm. and a single unit prep is always better than a full arch of individual preps. And then one thing that Greg taught me, and I did it on my next case, a full arch case, is prep the upper on Tuesday, prep the lower on, on Thursday. Man. Did it make a difference in my preps? Mm -hmm. Big time. I wasn't tired uh, going in. And don't think you're not tired because you get tired. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's like running, right? I right. can go out and run a mile and feel pretty good when I'm done. But if I go out and run a marathon, 
it's going to take its toll. Right. Right. That last mile might, might, might not be as good yeah, as exactly, the first hand. Right. Exactly. <laughs> You're so fatigued, and so it makes sense. This yes. is why choosing maybe burrs mm -hmm. that, ha like, maybe you don't need it for the single unit. You know, well, I would disagree with that. I know. I mean, yeah. I'm saying maybe you're there thinking, I don't need this for the oh, single right. unit. Yeah, see you see what I'm saying? Yep, yep. And that, but by the time you get over to number 15's prep, you're tired. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? And and some of the birds are helping you with efficiency mm -hmm. and predictability. But I think that's interesting that you would say, you know, that given an if you do it excellent right. preparation design mm -hmm. that milling really can be uh, mm -hmm. as good as as pressing and that's encouraging it is encouraging so if you look at the the pure um closure of the gap right but then you get into the concept of milling ceramic so um for example in a lab we can mill wax mm. we can use much smaller burrs to mill the wax um when you're milling ceramic the margins can chip. Mm -hmm. So that actually is one of the negative attributes of milling ceramic mm -hmm. is the brittleness. If you get into milling of zirconia, mm -hmm. right, you're typically milling it in a chalk, chalk state. state. Yes. yes. And if, if the margins get to be delicate, that, you know, chips as much or more than ceramic. Mm -hmm. So then you get into, do you have to over design the margin and then mill it so it's more stable, but then it's more effort after sintering to try right. and polish or grind it back. So there's no perfect world in any of this, right? Mm -hmm. You just have to understand where the um, <laughs> risk benefits are, right? Now you mentioned, you mentioned magnification a moment ago. Yeah, I was gonna what come do back you to that. feel the minimum magnification that we should choose in our loops uh, to have, to be able to see the detail that you really need to see? Uh, uh, for me, it would be four and a half power. And sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm using two and a half. I don't know if I can go to four and a half, right? And it's like, there's no really learning curve. Right. The only downside is the, the field of view gets smaller. Right. But I know, for example, Design for Visions is introducing their panoramic view, right? right? So all of a sudden now you mm. can see more even higher power magnification. Right. Um, so for me, the, the low magnification would be four and a half, but once you're comfortable there, then for sure you go to six, mm -hmm. right? Um, going beyond six with loops is pretty rare, but you can, you can get up to eight. The problem when you get into that power with loops is you can get head tremor, which you don't realize your head could be moving a little bit, but that can be a factor. Um, so four and a half is what I would encourage everyone to get to as their go-to loop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, and that's where we're at, four yeah. and a half and six. Yep. And so that's, and we, we completely agree. And it's interesting that you're seeing that you know, born out over thousands of students yep. Yep. and years, you know, that that, because I think oftentimes this discussion of what magnification is needed, it's, it can be very subjective coming from just one person to another saying this, but this is coming from a lot of experience, seeing how much of a difference that it can make. Yeah, right. I mean, absolutely. And when I first started, I'll say getting into all my thoughts on this, um, in my, actually in dental school, but in my grad program, we did all our own laboratory work, right? So in my, half of my career is spent doing laboratory work. And I was working with a microscope all the time. Mm -hmm. And I would be looking at <coughs> sometimes 10 or, you know, 14, 16 power. And when I went clinically, didn't have that power, I said to myself, I've checked it on the die. I can't do any better than that. So I have to assume it's that way in the mouth, wow. right? Yep. And so um, though if you have experience of seeing seeing is believing mm -hmm. then um you know you can put that into play and i was probably one of the first restorative dentists in the country uh, back in the 90s uh probably 1993 using an intraoral microscope mm. to do restorative dentistry not not endo and so that, that opened my eyes to the reality, right? Removing decay, you'd see the burr spinning sl almost slow speed, right? Right. And you see the dentinal chips coming off, and then you realize when you start checking things intraorally, what you thought was maybe perfect on your die, you saw the clinical reality mm. is nothing looks so good, right? Right. And so that was a little impressive but depressive, right? right? Um, but. Um, again, that's an appreciation. I try and share that to mm -hmm. get people to uh, appreciate four and a half 
is is minimal, right? To right. get to, and you go beyond that, it's great. You're certainly and not telling everybody they need to go out and buy a microscope well, today. Absolutely not. You know, well, if you're doing endo, for sure, mm -hmm. because it's for the last 20 years, it's been the standard of care. Right. right? Every endodontist yep. is right, trained sure. using one. Right. But restore to people, I say, if you want to go to higher power, learn by doing it on the endo, and then mm -hmm. translate it to restorative work, because your depth of field is so much smaller when you increase the power. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest challenge. But what I think is going to be transformational is the heads-up dentistry, which is coming um, very quickly right now. Mm. So you, um, some of the heads-up options are connecting it to a scope, um, but yet you're not looking through the microscope. You're looking at a TV monitor with 3D glasses. And so you see it three-dimensionally. So the learning curve there <coughs> is you're working here, but you're watching a TV, yeah. and that's no different than using a microscope. Because yep. I'm using a microscope, I'm wor looking here, working down here. But it's easier. But it's easier, less strain and so forth. Um, so who, that's... Who, who's working on that right now? Um, a number of companies. I've um, been exposed to several. Mm. In fact, this next week I'll be... I'm working with a company, evaluating, giving them direction mm -hmm. on on what I think needs to evolve uh, mm -hmm. with that. Um, so I've used them already, um, mm -hmm. not clinically, but on the bench top, and it, it's going to be transformational. So mm -hmm. um, you essentially it would be a tube, let's say the size of this microphone, that you move to where you want, yeah. right? And all you're doing is sitting back. Um, watching the TV monitor with 3D glasses and watching away. yourself prep a tooth. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so if you can't see right, you just do this and move it to a different angle, and so it's a it's a different world, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you're working with a microscope restoratively, then you have to figure out how you move the patient and so forth. So right. it is significantly more cumbersome. Mm -hmm. That's why doing endo first, you're lined up on a tooth, you're right. lined up at a hole, and you're working. Because you only need one basic view. How yeah, far exactly. is how far is the first iteration of something? Oh, they're available world? today. Okay. Um, I've, um, in fact, the one I would purchase is not FDA approved in this country, but it's available in Germany, mm -hmm. and and I've uh, worked with that a little bit. I have a dear friend that uses it in his office. In fact, he's buying a second, third already. Mm -hmm. That's how effective it is. He's a world class uh, clinician. We'll have mm -hmm. to talk after and the show about that a little bit more yeah. as far right. as you know what what's available because I think yeah. it's very interesting because it reminds me of. You know, navigation with implant surgery. It's that's kind right. Of a, that's the next. We're already there. You know, yep. we already have these available. And the the issue of just some of these being a little bit more cumbersome, I think, is just I'm sure going to improve tremendously. Well, and that's why I said some are connected to the microscope. So now right. you got this big microscope there. Well, for me, that's not where I want to go. I want to go to this tube that I move around. Yes. And so it's non absurd, non threatening of the patient right. and, and you can conveniently move it where you it's want. It's essentially a camera with really nice lenses. Well let, let's uh because yeah. we, we right. our our time is, is I know it's limited and I we man this is awesome. I didn't even expect <laughs> didn't, to have we, this conversation. That went I love in it. In a great place. But but right. technology while we're on the subject of technology. Yeah. So so there's some interesting new technologies coming about with in the lab world especially with regard to facial recognition and how digital smile design type of software, uh, facial recognition, how that affects our planning. Um, you know, where do you think we are now with that? You know, are you using digital software to do a lot of smile design preoperatively? Do you think facial recognition is, is really going to be something we're going to be using a lot of in the next, I'd say, five to ten years? Or do you think that that's still something that a good old bonded mock-up is still going to be PowerPoint you know, presentation yeah, with the little yeah tell it where, where do you think we are there okay so I always try and be reality based yeah yes um, meaning that what are 95 98 percent of the dentists doing mm -hmm. um, so what we're talking about now is you know a couple percent of people wanting to go down the pathway of really getting that involved digitally so personally have I implemented that no um, it's evolving. There's, I believe, there's um, hiccups in the road, some limitations, and how purely is it working? It's maybe not where it needs to be, but it's amazing compared to what it was a year ago, or two years ago, or three years ago. Right? Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of technology. It evolves so quickly. It's exciting. So, um, w within a reasonable timeline, whatever that is, five years, ten years, you know, would hopefully. 50 to 80 to 90 percent of dentists be doing these things sure you right. think so yeah, yeah. so okay. i mean it's just like intraoral scanners right yes um 
they're 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 not perfect by any means. Um, in fact, I just experienced this last week that if you take a traditional polyvinyl impression, right, and make a stone die, mm -hmm. you can see a mesial marginal ridge next to it's on a molar next to the bi. You can see it perfectly clearly, but with a digital impression, um, you can't read it because it's too close to the bicuspid. Mm, that's right. So so. Is everything perfect digitally? No. no. Right. Um, right. It's evolving. And well, we just talked about that a moment ago with, with when you and Greg were on is that, you know, things like texture and, uh, right. you know, printed models and some of the limitations that we still have with yeah. in the anterior with just being able to see and match uh, with, with, you know, the highest amount of accuracy. It's still, we're still working there. Yeah. And in fact, um, I tell people if, if they're um, living in the, in the digital world, stay in the digital world don't mix it with analog that's mm. so, so important so if you scan it and mill it in your office great now the tooth and the patient becomes the die and the articulator right right mm -hmm. that has its own unique challenges right because i can't hold the die under a microscope and look at all the different angles right so that's uh, unique challenges um but um it uh lost my train of thought on that one well but i think yeah, we're going yeah. from the digital to the analog world that yeah. that's, that doesn't always yeah, okay you can't so, go yeah, in yeah, and yeah, out yeah, of yeah, there yeah, very yeah, well absolutely so right going to the uh um digital information to for example a printed cast right right and and then working every, on that every, printed cast. every manufacturer wants to believe they've got a great excellent you know printer. printed cast right a, a excellent printer excellent for today's state of the art but there's it's a far cry from the reality of a stone cast from a polyvinyl impression. You're exactly right. And so when you start looking at the stepping or sometimes now it's the orange peel effect, mm. um, you, you, um, you lose that resolution. Well, yeah, you lose the resolution and you cannot, I, I cannot wax on that with accuracy, right. for example, and then invest in press. So I think the thing with like with smile design and some of this digital things is like some of the most simplest things help our patients create you know, helps our patients have awareness of what's going on and just having a, a good camera mm -hmm. learning how to use it properly taking a couple smile shots and putting it in a PowerPoint presentation with some simple teeth overlays yep. can help them understand what's going on and what may be possible to right. do for them right, right. and without that, getting into the world of things we can't actually well, without getting achieve to, to you know because we don't want to well, what create something on a screen promises. that we can't achieve yeah. Yeah. in yeah. the laboratory right. and that's where we're i feel like we've experimented with some of these technologies and you know we talked to our lab technician mm. and they say, and he says well, you know, you know cool. that tooth library there is not even available so like that's great <laughs> yeah but i right. can't i can't do that i can't translate that you right. know and now the patient you know you better hope they don't keep that picture that you gave them because you might not be able to achieve that be very yeah. careful what yeah. you show them because you have to produce well and there's yeah. this whole other side that, that we talk about with in the end efficiency matters yes and yes, it's great to talk about all of these really cool technologies, but in the end, who's responsible for going through and, and doing the smile design or mm -hmm. spending the time on that and who's getting paid for that? And, and if the dentist is just really passionate about that and loves doing mm -hmm. that, great. Yep. But if, it's, if you don't have that passion, not that you don't care about it, but if you want well, if you, you want have this to, to pass get, it on to right, like so a lab technician. Somebody's got to charge something to do that. Right. And, yeah. and I think there's a l big barrier there of, of training the lab technicians. Mm -hmm. And do they could be much more productive by milling a crown versus sitting there designing a case that may or may not even happen. Yep. And how much mm -hmm. do they charge for that? And that's what we've run into with our technicians is they say, well, we don't even really want to let people know this is available because we don't want to have to hire somebody that's just doing smile design in our lab and what do we pay that person and mm -hmm. these cases may or may not even get done yeah it's yeah. a big challenge i think well, listen Absolutely. i think this has been again another high level oh, man. great conversation with somebody that has taught us a lot mm -hmm. and we really appreciate what you're doing for dentistry today i'm interested to talk more about um, some of the future of dentistry right. and how we're going to be doing it and maybe after some more time with that over the next year or so. Yeah, we'd love to have you back on the show We'd love to have you sometime. back on to talk about to that. that. Yeah, It'd be great. Fun. So, Thank you. John, uh, this again, another Spear Summit. Awesome. 
amazing time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're missing out if you're not here. Yeah, so, so connect with us if you're seeing this uh, or listening to this right now. Uh, connect with us on our Facebook page, on Twitter. Let us know what you think. Give us some feedback. Connect with Spear Education's Facebook and Twitter. Also, let them know how much you appreciate you know them being available for us to uh, to have these discussions. And thank you so much to Dr. Bob Winter for being on the show today. Thank you. So for Dr. Winter, for Wes, I'm John. It's been fun. Well, I want to tell you about an interesting product, and it's. Uh, it's one that we have seen now, it's kind of new, but if you are a CAD CAM user, Wes, and you uh, are, are dealing with day-to-day -day with all your blocks, it's real hassle trying to keep track of all of your blocks that you're milling with. And Zerk has come out with a really nice product. It's called the CAD CAM Block Locker. Wes, let's talk about this. I mean, what, what, do, you, what do you think about this? What does it do for So people? when I go out to my garage, okay, and I have to go through a tool chest that's not organized. That's a problem. But yeah. when I can go to my actual chest, you know, you've, you've seen it. The snap-on tool chest where you can right. pull out a drawer, pull out an area that was designed for yeah. the product that right. you need. That's what block Where the 10-millimeter socket fits right in the 10-millimeter slot. That's what right. this is all about. That's what this is you all know, about. You so can, if you're a Sarek user... Or you're milling, yep. okay, using CAD CAM blocks, right. okay. But even this, if you're using the pl program mill, you know, yeah. really any kind of any kind of CAD CAM milling. Right. This is it for you because this is the tool chest that will keep you organized. And the, I love their slogan because time is everything. Because I don't have mm -hmm. time to go find the right block, the right color to put in the mill. I need to go right to the block locker right if you yeah, yeah if you're doing cad cam time is everything you know you need to have a workflow yep. a lot of times this is staff you're delegating this to so give the staff the and i'll tell you you give this you put this in the hands of an excellent assistant who loves organization you oh watch my. her use the online labeling that they can get you can you can uh you can hold hundreds of blocks in these things they have a small and a large mm -hmm. they have seven different several different colors i was gonna say different of course organizers. it's color coordinated with zerk you know? of course it's zerk yeah. it's got to be right and yeah. and you can you can set this in your lab and have access immediately to any shade any color ingot all the different translucencies yeah and, and and you know you can have it completely organized this is going to speed up your whole process and it just looks cool Wes. well I mean, let me just Zerk say right makes now. things that look cool and work at the same time what you need to do right now this is on your christmas list right now you just yeah. need to go ahead control block chaos and head over to zerk.com and purchase the block locker and mention the dental guys and yep. uh, we really tell appreciate them, Zerk. That, uh, we sent you I really appreciate zerk and their their help in sponsoring the show so we can bring you great quality products like this Thanks for listening to this bonus episode of The Dental Guys. If you want to connect with The Dental Guys, head over to thedentalguys.net or check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and now Instagram. Thank you for listening to this bonus content.